I thought uh, sometimes we all have a problem. One is, you know, when you're making a barhol, all the usual concepts, side, but one important thing we forget, sometimes, you know, put a lot of bone wax on the barhol and the dura. What happens is a little blood trickling down from there into the ventricle while you're actually going into the ventricle. It causes, makes the whole CSF completely hazy. And I have realized, you know, you rely on your residents and they will sometimes leave a little bit of... Uh, now, you know, uh, some little bleeding points there, it goes along the trajectory and when you are actually putting an endoscope there, it's all hazy. So that's something that you really need, uh, you know, to focus on. There's to be complete hemostasis and when you are actually making the pile, you know, uh, when you are perforating the pile, when you are going into the brain, just make sure that you have coagulated all the edges because along the track, even if there is a little blood going into the ventricle, it makes the whole ventricle hazy and you don't want any blood into the ventricle before you are doing your endoscope, it's a small thing. And the other very important thing is the angle of the camera. See, the camera can, you can change the uh, magnification. So what happens sometimes is that if you don't make the angle wide enough, then you don't get an overview. And when you are uninitiated into this endoscopy business, then what happens is sometimes with a heavily magnified view, you're going inside and causing damage inside. So just make sure that you have a relatively wide angle of the camera. Just you can easily adjust that. The small things, you, you completely forget about them. Then the third is, uh, you know, the technique of taking a biopsy. See, I have found that there is a very nice technique to doing it. See, what happens is that you just put it inside and you don't know when to open the, the scissors or when to open the biopsy forceps. And if you open it within the endoscope tube, you are going to damage your instrument rather than, you know, the whole thing. That's a very simple thing, but you know, it's a very practical problem which I have seen. So the important thing is to just, first of all, just keep the edge of that instrument protruded a little more than your endoscope, a little more than your endoscope, so you're completely seeing it, you're completely watching it. Then the important thing is to touch the tumor surface and then open it. And then when you open it, then you take it a little deeper into the tissue and twist it a little. And then close it and withdraw it. It's a small technique, I mean, it appears so stupid, I mean, my talking about it, but you try it and you will understand what I'm talking about, you know, just a small thing. I'll repeat it again, see the whole thing going inside, take it a little, so that guides you to where you want to go, touch the tumor, go a little deeper and twist it a little and then close it. So you have adequate tissue and then you take it out. A small thing, but it really helps. You know, this is all sterilized and formally in most of our centers and what happens is this is this may cause severe ventriculitis. So just make sure that you completely clean it, you know, irrigate it well, mm -hmm. irrigate your endoscopes, irrigate everything because the lens systems, because this will cause severe ventriculitis. Children less than one year, a lot of people say this much, this percentage result, that percentage result. I would say when you start your endoscopy, when you are actually doing it, you want perfect results, please don't do it. The arachnoid dilution may not form and there are lots of issues, don't just do it. The CSA, the subarachnoid spaces may not form, don't just do it. The other thing is when ch children, you know, warm irrigation is important. Because, you know, if you just use cold irrigation, they, these children will become hypothermic. So just you must make sure that it's just warm body temperature, not hot, but just body temperature. This is very, very important. The other thing is, you know, a lot of you would have some experience and you will not have another assistant who has assisted. Will you do the biopsy or will the person with less experience do the biopsy? So this is very important. You don't have to do the procedure. You don't have to do the procedure. The procedure has to be done by your assistant who has no experience. Okay? You have to hold the endoscope. You have to show him the view. And when you are actually a person who has no experience, will not be able to perceive depth. So what do you do at that point of time? What you need to do is to keep the endoscope a little away from the tumor. That way you get a wider wider field and it's easier for him to reach that point. Once you reach the point, then he will not move the instrument. You will take it down. He has no experience. He is only seeing a two-dimensional view. What you need to do is to take the endoscope there and, and guide him there. So keep the endoscope away. He sees the entire view. Take it there and then you guide it. This is a small practical point which I think uh, is very, very important. And then of course about bleeding, like everyone tells you, don't please remove the endoscope when there is bleeding. Don't remove the endoscope. Just keep it there and sit and just keep on irrigating, 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 irrigating. Right? Don't remove your endoscope. Once you remove your endoscope, it's impossible to go in again. Just keep it there and take a chair, sit down. Why do I say take a chair? Very practical problem. See, you are completely focused on the point, you know. 
your leg goes off to sleep. See what happens is you are holding it like that and you are not moving your leg. It appears like a laughing matter that suddenly you will fall. Because you know, you, you don't move your leg because you are focused there, you are looking there, it's bleeding and you are just looking, irrigating, irrigating, irrigating and your leg goes off to sleep. <laughs> I am just telling you, it's a small situation where you need to also, so you are stressed out, you are looking there and you have forgotten about your own leg. Huh? So, so it's a small thing, okay. So now I will just take you to some situations. So one is ventriculitis. Now this so repeated shunt infection, what do you actually see in the ventricle? Most of you would not have seen. So it's completely hazy. This is what you see. This is the foramen of Monroe. There's no choroid plexus, no thalamostriate vein. This is the foramen of Monroe that you see, right? But there is no other option. Repeated shunt malfunctions, you have to go in, this young girl, and you see that there is a thick membrane there at the foramen of Monroe. This is what you see when you actually go in for a ventriculitis. So go on irrigating, irrigating. And the interesting thing is go deep inside. This is the view that you get there and then to keep going inside and when you actually go inside it will be heartening to know that you know suddenly things will clear up right so it's not that it's all like that right so you will see that you will be just don't worry just go in it will this is like yes. so suddenly you will start getting your landmarks right <laughs> so and the other thing is, you know, sometimes what happens is that it's all very thick, you know. So this, this, so this, you're just getting the brain stem here, and it's all very thick there. So you just palpate the dorsum cellae. Once you palpate the dorsum cellae in such a situation, then you can go anterior to it and go to the premammillary membrane. So just a small, I mean, just posterior to it and just see, get the premembrane. So, this is, so you can now see the mammillary bodies, you can see the basilar artery, and this is the membrane. So sometimes what happens is that in ventriculitis, you might say, oh, it's all hazy, you're not getting this. Just, just have patience, go slowly, you just make sure that you're irrigating well and you will get to the point where you can actually do a... And, and then the interesting thing is, once you puncture it, you will find that the CSF cisterns below that point are absolutely clear. So sometimes there will be ventriculitis because of a shunt infection, but below that, you will find the CSF is absolutely clear. It's a good option. You know, it's not that, okay, this ventriculitis, you won't be able to do it. It's not like that. And you know, you just put, try, see, now you see the difference, you know. Suddenly you will see that you will be able to see the vessels, you'll be able to see the cistern, you'll be able to, it, it will get a reasonably good picture. You know, it's not like, you know, it's like all. So this is one interesting situation where I think uh, you need to, uh, this is an interesting situation. Now we come to another very interesting situation. <laughs> so. So now we come to the next very interesting situation, that is this situation, right? Now, remarkable results. You take this tumor and, um, you know, you go in, do a microsurgery, this, that, but, you know, this is uh, dilated and just do an endoscopy, just to decompress it and uh, give radiotherapy, remarkable results. The whole thing after you see follow-up is completely gone, you know? However, what are the problems? So I'll just take you right from the burr hole to the space. So we're just going. So this is we've reached the point, and this is the tube. This is the craniopharyngioma at the foramen of Monroe, and uh, so this is the septal vein. Like I told you, this is the choroid plexus, and this is the tube. So you see, this is the here. Now comes the interesting power point. <laughs> so. I mean, you know, you, this is what I'm saying, because, you know, it's, theoretically it's all fine, you know, you'll do an endoscopy, but you'll see the practical problem in a second. <laughs> I'll just show you. There's no complication. This is the usual situation. So, you know, so it's a beautiful cyst, perfect to be, you know, managed. Now, it looks so beautiful, right? Like a copybook picture, right? A textbook picture. I'm building up the suspense, you know, it takes the hunger away. <laughs> so you can actually see all around and then, so, you know, it's like, so you just go there and ah, uh, it's like very beautifully cystic thing, uh, and this is what happens. Okay, so this is what happens. <laughs> so, so you don't see anything there, no log. So you just now comes that point. You you don't see an your endoscope is inside, and you don't see a single anatomical landmark there. See here, I have kind of edited it to I mean you know lessen the trauma. <laughs> But you know, when the whole green fluid gushes out, it is completely green. <laughs> and you don't know where you are. You are in the foramen of Monroe, and you are going deep inside, and this, this is what you keep seeing, okay? 
don't remove your endoscope please don't remove it just keep it there okay just keep it there keep it there keep it there keep it there and go on irrigating irrigating and when you are irrigating keep make sure that all your ports are open you know so that it the fluid is also coming out just go on doing and then gradually you know it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer right so then you see that you get little comfortable because now from green it is becoming white and then you see the floor now comes your second problem what is your second problem here now this you are within the cyst here and unless you make a, another fenestration from the cyst into the cisternal space i mean there is no way you will be able to drain it it will close up again it will fill up again and it will become a cyst like that again so what do you do now you have to there is no there are no landmarks you don't know where you are you don't know where the basilar artery is you don't know where and sometimes there may be a part which is calcified right so this is where you know this is another point now this is a moment of truth make small 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 you can make small monopolar and just make sure that you see so you see oh well can you go there yeah you can see the cistern there oh that's great you can see the cistern there right so there you have to be very very careful here right and i mean you know it's just a little matter of luck also i mean <laughs> to be very honest you don't know where you are uh, but once you do that then you see you can actually make a second fenestration there you, and then you can so just make one or two fenestrations you can combine all of them and then once you do that then you have the whole cisternal space in front of you always make a double fenestration and go in so this is a second situation wherein you know you will completely get unsighted and and you know it appears oh it's all very simple <laughs> but you know when you the whole thing becomes green and you don't know where you are right so now you see you see the cisternal spaces you see the beautiful vessels and you say oh wow i've done a great job <laughs> but you know you understand these such problems this is the other issues with you so you see the whole thing and then you can right so this is the second situation that you need to look at so this is the post op and then of course with radiotherapy fantastic results you know this some of these they don't need any any other thing the third is this very interesting case okay <laughs> now this is an interesting case uh, like you know you can take a biopsy you can do a fenestration small bore hole third day the child can go back home right so now again the same thing you go back in again and here you know another very interesting thing when you are going this this is the moment of truth you usually don't see that you know and so when you're going hey, have i gone too deep where have i gone why am i not reaching the ventricle you'll reach ventricle subsequently and you see this cyst here right you see this beautiful cyst here right now here the issue is completely different so the same you think it's again clear csf inside the cyst okay fine this was a very thick membrane this is not simply you know it couldn't just be taken off so here sometimes you know you may need a monopolar or something you can decompress and you see the beautiful anatomy here just like a copy book picture but here there is no suspense of course you will again see the white thing and here this time like you are more comfortable right now i was also very comfortable i said oh yeah now i'll get a hazy picture for some time and then it will all clear off so here i'm just going there and so the important thing is to keep the trajectory there and then you guide your assistant to actually reach the point so many times i will have residents who have never done a single endoscopy and so i allow them to do this and they feel very happy <laughs> they are doing it but actually you are doing it <laughs> you know so so again you know just make some small the monopolar you make some and then it's very important to keep the choroid plexus away so just do that so again the same thing you know you have this whole thing is completely hazy you don't know where you are and it's very very complicated you know it's like you say so you just keep waiting 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 and as you're getting very dirty and then another problem sometimes is that you don't actually get the bottom of the thing this is another problem sometimes you know you don't get to the bottom of it and just making one fenestration is not adequate so you have to actually make a double fenestration to reach the lower part without a double fenestration there's no point so again make a and this specially happens when there is calcification and when there is a very thick membrane and that's where you really really need to <coughs> feel the dorsum cell and sometimes with that you can actually get a very vague idea i mean it's not necessary but you get a vague idea so this is so this is what so you say oh this is not a classical endoscopy but this is a true life situation where you know so videos look good but <laughs> you know this is what it happens what happens actually when you are so now you get this thing where you don't know where you are and uh, so here what happened was that the endoscope had actually there was a thin flimsy wall at the bottom and we had actually reached up to the uh, the the subarachnoid space there so you have to be very careful about your depth perception here
you understand? So there was no fenestration made, it was, a, it was a spontaneous fenestration and you can actually see, see, now you can, within, when the haze clears up a little when you are irrigating, you can actually see all the vessels there. <laughs> you understand? So this is one important thing that you need to also look at, right? So you draw depth perception, sometimes you know, now we come to the, and when you are coming out, you can see all the crystals are all over and uh, there's a, so this is the post-op image, but I mean, this was a spontaneous double fenestration. <laughs> I, I, I didn't plan the lower part of it, right? But I was just lucky, you know, beginner's luck, you know. And now comes the colloid cyst, right? Such a simple tumor, wow. Now, so it's pointing towards one ventricle. You can go right in, just remove it, and such a beautiful job, right? Let's see what happens. So again, the same thing. Just take you through the same thing, like that, you know, you know, you get an orientation and then you actually go inside and uh, so this is a beautiful colloid cyst, right? Huh? And uh, you know, it's like, oh wow, this is like so nice, right? <laughs> now what happens with this is, the, the suspense. So it's like, you know, pointing towards you, you know, it's like, wow, wanting to be taken out, right? <laughs> Packed lunch. <laughs> this is packed lunch. <laughs> Wanting to be eaten, right? <laughs> so here, it's very thick. The membrane is very, very thick, right? So what you need to do is to, with uh, um, you know, monopolar, what you need to do is to make several fenestrations there, right? Make several fenestrations, and even with that, that you know, it's very difficult because you. Know, and then comes the problem. The problem is that this is so thick. <laughs> The, the secretion, that it's not even flowing out, okay? It's not even flowing out. <laughs> you know, you see, it's hanging there. <laughs> it's not even flowing out. And, you know, your suction tubing is not sucking this, right? <laughs> you don't know what to do with this, you know? It's not flowing out, and your suction tubing is not sucking it. So what do you do with this? Like yeah, and then, so you take a biopsy forceps. Now your biopsy forceps has a one millimeter opening, man. How, you don't have the patience to keep doing that all the time. How much can you do? You know, you know even a patient man like me doesn't have the patience to you know, go on with the biopsy forceps. How much can you take out of the biopsy forceps, right? There's nothing, it, it's too, so thick it doesn't come out. So what do you do is, you take a monopolar, and the secretions you cut with the monopolar, okay? So you cut the secretion with the monopolar and allow them to float away. <laughs> you can't catch them and bring them back, okay? So you cut them with the monopolar, so that's what I'm doing. Cutting the secretions with the monopolar and allowing them to float away. <laughs> A real life situation, okay? It doesn't, I mean, it's so difficult to take this out sometimes. And, and the last part of the capsule is will always have a fibrovascular core, which is in the third ventricle. So please, you can just leave it alone. Leave that small capsule alone and don't try to do a total job in this, because this is a benign tumor. What is the maximum which can happen? After you have decompressed the entire colloidosis, if the hydrocephalus persists, you can always go in and do a shunt, right? Uh, the colloidosis is over, you can go in, just do a simple shunt and come out, right? But you try to try to remove the capsule and this is going to be a disaster. And so with this thick secretion, what happens is, see, you just try to keep on doing it. This is like not, not a two minute job, it's an edited video, otherwise a 20 minute thing, you're just going, removing, going, removing, and it's not getting removed, right? So this is also one situation where you can get into some kind of a trouble and you really need to look at this situation, right? So what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, there are some other very interesting problems which arise when you actually do all these endoscopies and you need to actually, you know, with experience, uh, innovate. Because right now I think the technology is not, uh, you know, uh, kind of has not progressed enough for us to uh, deal with every situation here. So we have to continuously innovate when we are actually doing the thing. So this is, this is, this is some of the situations which I wanted to talk, talk to you about. And this is, of course, the post-operative thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so the other thing is, when you're doing a colloid cyst, like the situation which came. Now, this was a classical situation. You think this is also amenable to move, but this is a little posterior. So this appears like a classical, but this is a little posterior, you know? And sometimes, you know, you will, it will not come at the foramen mono. Here, don't go in endoscopically. You know, if you think that it is, don't go in endoscopically. This is another important thing. And then, of course, uh, complication. When you are actually dealing with uh, epidermoids, okay, when you are dealing with neurocysticercosis endoscopically, that's when you have to be very aware of ventriculitis. 
right? Now, this was a young child, and uh, I thought there's a fantastic epidermal that it can be removed endoscopically. I don't have the pre-op images, but this child developed such severe ventriculitis. This is uh, a post-operative image after five years. This child developed uh, complete cognitive disturbances, could not go to <coughs> school. <laughs> I'm not even sure if the child could see, okay? And this was simply because there was such there's so much of ventriculitis that this is, I mean, amazing ventriculitis. I mean, this remained, we didn't know whether it was chemical ventriculitis or whether it was uh, infective ventriculitis. And then it went on for five years. And at the end of five years, these were the images. So, you know, this was epidermal or this is dermoid, sorry. So you, you sometimes, you know, you have to be aware of these things. And just um, sometimes these, these are issues which, uh, and then, of course, uh, during your endoscopy, there is some problem that you need to look at. One is, of course, I told you about hypothermia. The second is bradycardia. I mean, continuously you must tell your anesthetist, please look at the pulse. And th as soon as there is bradycardia, please make sure there's no bradycardia, because that means that there is actually brainstem distortion because of excessive fluid accumulation. The fluid that you're irrigating is not coming out, right? That's very important. Now, if you get dilated ventricles with bilateral subdural effusion, now that's a very tricky situation. I think your third ventriculostomy not, may not be working. Because what is happening is that the entire CSF is actually coming out through the port that you went through and uh, is actually accumulating outside. And that's when I think if there is progressive <coughs> hydrocephalus, you must plan in a ventriculoperitoneal shunt or maybe repeat in a third ventriculostomy. So this is something that you really need to look at. And of course, hemorrhage and infection are important aspects. So I mean, minimally invasive tool to be utilized for very specific indications. It's not that you try to fool around with it. <laughs> you know, that's what I think. Thank you very much. Thank you.